So this CV has to do with an Azure Sphere. What is Azure Sphere? Well, it's a project by Microsoft to improve the security of IoT or Internet of Things devices. And the basic idea is that they have outlined some hardware requirements that they think are necessary for a secure Internet of Things device. They've worked with third-party vendors to get them to make microprocessors that have those security requirements baked into the hardware. And then the idea is that they will provide a specialized and locked down minimized version of Linux that is capable of running on a typical IoT device. And that Linux will be able to use, you know, secure transports, SSL, all that kind of thing in order to reach out to Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud system. And the idea is this, you know, small device will be able to reach back securely through a secure encrypted tunnel and be able to get whatever software updates or application downloads or whatever it needs. So this particular vulnerability was found in some Microsoft specific modifications to the Linux kernel pertaining to optimizations. A little bit about the Linux kernel components that are going to factor into the vulnerability. The first thing is namespaces, which are basically like sandboxes or jails a place where a process can notionally behave as if it's root, but in reality be isolated down and be limited in terms of the user IDs, group IDs, root directory, capabilities and keys that it is actually capable of accessing. So basically it can have full privileges while inside the user namespace, but it's unprivileged for operations outside of the namespace. Okay, so a process that is within a namespace on the Azure Linux system for at the time that this vulnerability was found, had the capability to spin off an IPC namespace. And this was then further isolating things pertaining to IPC, interprocess communication resources, such as System 5 IPC objects or POSIX message queues being the main thing that we're going to care about here. So specifically, with respect to these POSIX message queues, uh, they're exposed via a typical Linuxy proc namespace. So we've got the proxys FSMQ, so message queue. And the important thing here from the man page that I've bolded is it says when an IPC namespace is destroyed, for instance, the last processor or uh, that is a member of the namespace terminates, all IPC objects in the namespace are automatically destroyed. So this particular vulnerability has to do with the capability of an attacker to spin up an IPC namespace cause the instantiation of those message queue information, but there's going to be a lack of initialization down one particular extra optimization path that was added, and that lack of initialization subsequently will lead to uninitialized data being used when the IPC namespace is being destroyed or torn down. And unfortunately, as is often the case with uninitialized data access bugs, an attacker can actually turn that from uninitialized data into attacker controlled data and consequently have some beneficial consequence. Consequently have a beneficial consequence, good. To find the flaw, we would look through all sorts of code that I would have put on the website for you. And what I really wanted you to do is go with the initialization flow so that instead of tracking acid, we could track the cleaning power of the healing initialization, which makes the things all appropriate and not attacker controlled. Unfortunately, we can't do that because it turned out the deeper I got into this vulnerability and trying to explain it to you, I ultimately came up with the fact that to fully explain this and to fully rigorously track all of the initialization for all of the objects, both, you know, correct, like directly related and tangentially related, which you don't necessarily know at the time when you're hunting for the vulnerability. You don't know where the uninitialized, you know, data may be or the access may occur. The further I got into this, the more I saw that this would probably take an hour just to, ex you know, track and show all of this. And so I decided that's not going to be a good use of your time. So I'll just go ahead and walk through the code to show where the vulnerability occurs as a way of showing you one of these types of vulnerabilities that has to do with different paths for different control flow leading to this kind of bug. So let's go ahead and go out to the code I would have given you if I was trying to, you know, show you just the minimally relevant part. And within the code for message queues, there's these data structures that have a bunch of function pointers in them. And so it's going to start with this one, this MQFS type. It's going to have a name and then some function pointers. And the initial function, which is called, would be this init MQFS. It's called by device init call. And if we would have went through this, we would have eventually seen that this particular register file system is registering this MQ proc file system. 
it's passing in this particular function pointer, which would be this one. And then subsequently, this init fs context is going to be called, and then this would be invoked. And so just to get closer to the code faster, I'll just say that, you know, that init fs context calls the registers, this other function pointer, the other function pointer uh, leads to this mq get tree being called, and that ultimately leads to the mq fill super being called. So we're going to pick up the control flow right there and see what we have. So mq fill, fill super is where we're going to start looking at the code. So I'm going to go over here in the mq.c, find that, and let's start here. Now, I'm going to tell you that the particular vulnerability has to do with inode being uninitialized. So it has nothing to do with this file system context, nothing to do with this super block. And so, you know, if you were looking for the vulnerability, you would have to keep track. You'd say, oh, okay, I see a bunch of initialization here, but is everything initialized? And, you know, if you go look at these data structures, these data structures have a ton of fields. And that is part of why I felt that it was not probably worth your time to track and show everything for all of that initialization and all of this initialization. Let's just focus on the inode where the vulnerability is. So what we have here is an inode, which is an inode pointer. So typically we would expect that if we have a pointer and it's being set equal to something, the thing that is setting it equal probably is an allocation, right? Because you can't, you know, usefully use this thing. You can't, you know, fill in values and initialize it if it doesn't have any backing data, if it's just a plain pointer. So we're going to go ahead and drill down into MQ get inode. Inside of here, we can see again a new inode, an inode, and then there's some initialization occurring here. But this looks like this new inode is where it's actually allocated, so let's drill down into that. All right, we see some spin lock, so that's mutual exclusion, and then we see a new inode pseudo, again being set to that, and it's ultimately returning the inode, so let's go ahead and drill down once more. And then we have an alloc inode, so let's drill down once more. Okay, now here, we're going to have this super block pointer data structure. It's going to have this S ops, which is the super operations. And the ops is going to be checked. It's going to say, is this ops of alloc inode not null? And if so, call alloc inode. So that means it must be a function pointer. So call that function, otherwise call this function. So we need to figure out four MQs, four super operations. Is it actually have a uh, alloc inode thing? So we're going to Go back here, we're going to search for super operations, and we're going to see that yes, there is an alloc inode. So basically, if that exists, if it's non null, if it got filled in in the structure, then it's going to call that function. So let's go ahead and call, let's drill into that. Now, this is specifically the place where there's two control flow paths depending on what macro flags are defined. So you can see it says if def config disable mq inode cache. So if we have set a macro to disable the inode cache, then just kmalloc it. Else, use the cache alloc. So basically on one path, you just straight up allocate a new thing that's going to be, you know, have some inode coming back. So this data structure passes back and has a EI, and then EI VFS inode is actually a inode that is baked into this data structure. So now we're not dealing with a pointer, we're dealing with the actual inode struct which itself is once again one of those giant complicated structures. That giant complicated structure is built into this structure, and this structure is being allocated either via a plain kmalloc or via a kmem cache alloc. So basically the vulnerability that's going to occur here is that if it goes down this path, so if the system had been compiled or configured in such a way that it had this set so that it did kmalloc path, then that MQ inode info would be uninitialized at that point, and consequently the inode would also be uninitialized that gets handed back. Instead, if we went down this path, it turns out that the creation of this cache uh, leads to initialization of the uh, this particular inode built into this particular struct. So just to kind of prove that to ourselves, we would have to search for MQ inode cache. That's the cache that's being, you know, pulled from here. And if I, I already have the search here, so if I search for that, I would see, well, that gets filled in in the KMM cache create. So if I went there, I would see, okay, this KMM cache create, you call that, and then now all of a sudden this thing's filled in with something useful. And just to spare you, again, you know, tons of drill down, I'll say that this init once is going to be the important thing. So basically, this KMM cache create it has a function pointer at the last 
argument and that function pointer is what's going to be called to initialize things. So basically if we look at this init once and we scroll down and we get the one specifically for IPC MQ, the init once for an MQ is this and then we drill down once more and sorry, just going back a second, you can see that this is specifically the VFS inode portion of this enclosing structure. And so if we go here, then here we see a bunch of list initialization. We see zeroing out the entire inode. So this is all good and appropriate initialization. Like that's good. The problem is that when, you know, an optimized path was put in or a sort of unoptimized path in some sense, right? They're disabling the inode cache. In that path, then all of a sudden this control flow never gets hit, it never initializes the inode properly, and consequently uh, these things are going to be uninitialized. Now, particularly, I will tell you that it is this field specifically which ultimately will be used uninitialized that will cause an error. So at destruction time, this is still going to be uninitialized, and because the attacker could cause it to take on attacker-controlled value by just setting a bunch of information in the heap and then that information gets reused when the inode is allocated and then this unfilled in struct subsequently has values that are attacker controlled that is going to be what causes the problem so again back up back up back up this is the core control flow difference in path and now let's just assume the inode is going to have attacker controlled values at destruction time so let's go ahead and find the destruction time function so again, there's like a, a giant backtrace of functions that would be ultimately relevant, but we're going to just jump right to the I put final, uh, which is called when we're dropping the last reference to an inode. So let's go there. And so I'll tell you that the majority of all this stuff and the interim doesn't really matter, and it's ultimately just this line which is going to matter. And so this line is a check for is the list empty for the inode ILRU. And that's the one we said that is uninitialized and consequently attacker controlled at this point. So it's getting the address of that particular list and it's checking is it empty. Well, the is empty is actually a little bit interesting how that was uh, chosen to be implemented. So the is empty checks a list. And so these are, these are list head elements and they're basically a typical doubly linked list. You have a list head pointer to next and a list head pointer to previous. And so they're basically just, you know, pointing forward and backwards. And so it's going to read out the head next. So it's going to say, is the next thing it points to pointing back at itself, at the, you know, head address. So does it next point to itself? Therefore, it must be empty at this point. But because the attacker will actually control this head of next, so basically, again, it's a structure with two pointers in it. The attacker controls those two pointers, but he doesn't control where the structure is actually allocated. So they don't control the address of head, but they do control the next field of head. So they control this, and therefore they can ensure that this is always going to return false to indicate that the list is not empty. And so if it returns false, then if not false is true, goes into this next line. And so now we've got this inode, which is uninitialized and attacker controlled ILRU inside of there. That's being passed into this delete list. And that's where the problems are going to start. So let's go ahead and jump into there. And now we're going to start tracking acid like we've done in previous classes. So this inode ILRU, that is the thing that is attacker controlled. Again, they don't control the address. They don't know where it's going to be allocated. They just control the stuff inside this particular list head. So I don't know for sure whether this inode SP, ISB S inode LRU, I don't know if that's attacker controlled or not. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter for purposes of looking further in here. So I just uh, skipped it, but you of course can go and drill into it if you'd like. So we're going to treat this as acid and we're going to drill down now. It is the content at item. It is not items address, but the content at item, which is acid. So this right here is going to basically calculate the physical address in memory from the virtual address and then convert it to some node ID, which we don't care about. Again, the attacker does not control the address of item and therefore they can't ultimately control this NID. So that's non-attacker controlled. 
and therefore they don't control this unless they control L LRU, which I'm going to assume for now they don't, but you know, I don't know, maybe they do. So I'm going to say that's not attacker controlled either. But down here later on, again, the attacker can bypass this list at empty check and they can make sure that it goes down below that. And so if we drill into this, we can see there's one presumed non-acid, one presumed acid and one null. So let's click into that. Well, the first argument is use presumed non-acid and that's what's used to return. The second argument is the acid, but that's straight up not even used in this function and this was null. So we don't care about that and that does a whole bunch of nothing. But because it passed back this L from the presumed non-attacker controlled, then we'll also presume non-attacker controlled L. And this is where we finally get into some serious trouble. So item is attacker controlled. The data added is attacker controlled. We click in, we go to the definition, and then we click in here and go to the definition because that's just passing through. And again, we're going to not care about that. We're going to focus on the actual delete. And this is where we have a problem. This entry of previous, that is exactly the attack controlled value that was set because it was never initialized. And next is also attack controlled because it was never initialized. So when we drill into there, finally we have next and previous are attacker controlled, both in terms of, you know, their address and consequently, you know, whatever is at that address, if the attacker can control, you know, some data structure somewhere in memory. So that means basically we have attacker controlled value written to attacker controlled value. And that is that ultimately powerful write what where type primitive. So now the attacker can clobber sort of any memory anywhere that they want. And that's a good time for an attacker. Okay, so that's the bug and back to our slides. So again, it was way, way more complicated to try to show you all the initialization everywhere on every control flow path. And that's partially why, you know, if you go dig into this, you'll see just how difficult it could be to actually find these things through manual looking as opposed to using some tooling. But of course, that's why we have to program paranoid and initialize everything. Because of course, it's not paranoia if they really are out to get you. So what was the fix for this? Well, diffing the 2101 code versus 2102 yields the following addition. So we said that it was down this control flow path, down the key malloc path that we had the issue because there was an uninitialized uh, inode. And so here we see that they added an inode init once, called on this VFS inode, and then that will take and initialize all these inode fields, importantly the ILRU. So you know, I think that's an okay initialization. I would have preferred that they do like we say and initialize everything so that this entire MQ inode info would actually be guaranteed initialized. Right now, there's a whole bunch of other fields in that structure that are not guaranteed initialized. Clearly, this solves the exact point problem that was reported here, but who's to say that there's not other problems with uninitialized data uses elsewhere? Well, don't know for sure, and it is not easy to check, or at least not in like the couple of minutes that I spent on it. So you can feel free to go and check whether or not this uh, MQ inode info leading into this EI leads to some other uninitialized data access somewhere else, but you will of course run into lots of fun indirect control flow, so have fun with that if you choose to do that.